dark here. It's a little dim because uh, uh, all my slides are in black. So please don't fall asleep. I'll try to speak loudly and quickly to keep us high energy. So the story of how this, how this talk came about was uh, uh, I realized last year that like conference season tends to line up with Apple's operating system release schedule, and I'm a huge Apple fanboy, and I always want to be riding like, the latest and greatest. Uh, but at the same time, I also need to make sure my slides work, because I'm always really nervous about that uh, getting broken. And uh, you know, maybe it was because they announced the iPad Pro or something, but I was thinking like maybe OS 9 is finally ready for me to build an entire talk in it and really put my you know, typical 80 hours of work into building a slide deck. So this talk was written entirely in OS 9. Let's boot it up and see how it goes. Please bear with me. All right, so we're starting up. It's a little retro. The flat look. All right, so I just got to find my, my talk on the desktop. All right, it's Apple Works 6. And I got to find the play button there. And here we go. This talk is called How to Stop Hating Your Tests. Um, my name is Justin. I play a guy named Searles on the internet. And uh, like Jonah so kindly introduced, uh, I work at a company called Test Double, a really great software agency. Uh, if you don't know me, uh, you might recognize this face as being associated with lots of snarky tweets getting retweeted. Uh, I'm told I don't actually look like this anymore, uh, which is depressing for my hairline. Uh, this is the uh, Tapper edition of the talk. I've never given a talk at a conference that served free beer, but I hope that means that you all like this more than you otherwise would. Um, and let's dive in. You know, like I talked about hate and tests. Why do people hate their tests? And I, what I think happens is that there's this cycle that teams almost always seem to go through. First, you start a new project, you're in experimentation mode, you're just like making stuff work, you're having fun, you're doing new things, and you're iterating really quickly. And eventually, you get into production, it's important that your stuff still works, so you start to write some tests, you put a build around it, you make sure that your new changes don't break stuff. But without a lot of forethought, without a lot of planning, you know, like it's likely those tests are gonna be slow, and as they aggregate, they're gonna really feel like a, like a burden. Eventually, you see teams get to this point where like they feel like they're slaves to their builds, to their tests, and they're always just cleaning up tests, and they're yearning for the good old days when they didn't have to, to worry about that. They could just move fast and break things. And I see this pattern often enough that I'm beginning to think that an ounce of prevention might be worth a, a pound of cure in this instance. Because once you get to the end, there's only so much you can do. You can say, like, oh, our test approach isn't working. And, like, how do you respond to that? You might say, well, then apparently you're just not testing hard enough. You need to buckle down. And whenever I see the same problem emerge over and over again, I'm, I'm never a fan of the work harder comrade approach, right? I think we should really like introspect our tools and our workflows and be open and honest. Maybe like how we're testing or that we're testing isn't that effective. Another thing that I see people do is like they'll say, hey, you know, like clearly we're off, off, off page, off base here. Testing is job one. Let's treat it as the most important thing and try to remediate. And you might get away with this for a little while, but testing is never job one from the people who are paying our paychecks. At best, it's job two. The job one is shipping stuff, is getting stuff out the door, and you, you can only get away with this impedance mismatch for so long. And if you're, you know, not Greenfield, I'm talking about prevention stuff today, if you're in like a big monolithic app and you're like checking out now because you're like, oh, well, this is all about, you know, stuff to do at the beginning of a project, I'm w it's way too late for me, don't worry, not a problem. There's this one weird trick to starting fresh with test testing. That's right, you're going to find out what the one weird trick is. Um, basically, you just <laughs> move your tests into a new directory create a second directory, and then you have two directories, and you can write a shell script that runs the tests out of both directories until, like, you know, as you're porting them over to the new clean test suite, uh, eventually maybe you can decommission the old crappy tests. Um, now, I hesitated before giving this talk or producing it at all uh, because I'm the worst kind of expert. I've got, like, years of navel-gazing in the Agile community about testing. I've done lots of open source projects to, to help people with tests. I've been that guy on every single team you've ever been on who cares just a little bit more about testing than you do. And I, I'm, I'm in so many highfalutin Twitter spats about terminology and stuff that I don't know why anybody follows me. So. My advice, if I were just to tell you what I really thought, is toxic. It would just demotivate you. It's risk averse. It's, it's no fun at all. And so my goal today is instead of just spewing all that at you, is to dis distill down that toxic hell stew of opinion into three component parts. The first one I want to talk about is structure, like the physicality of our tests, like how are we writing and laying them out and organizing our code. The second 
is isolation. Because what I've found is that how you isolate the thing you're testing from the, the, the components around it communicates the concept of the value that you're trying to get out of the test. And finally, we're going to talk about feedback. Do our tests make us happy or sad? Are they fast or are they slow? What's it like to live with these tests, and what can we do to make it better? Now, keep in mind, we're always talking from like, the perspective of prevention here. These, are, these might be new or different for, for your particular project, but I hope that you can pick up some of them along the way uh, and experiment with them yourself. Now, it was at around this point that I realized uh, doing custom artwork in Apple Work 6 is a huge pain in the ass. Uh, so my brother picked up this old Family Feud Apple II game, and we just ripped off the artwork from that. So uh, we're going to just operate off of this like, Family Feud board. Um, uh, uh, it, it's a real board because like, if I point to it and I say something ridiculous like, show me potato salad, uh, it'll give me an X. Uh, but I, in fact, I didn't have 100 people to survey for, for populating this board. I just surveyed myself 100 times. So I know all the answers. <laughs> I know all the answers already. So, so it's going to be a really bad game of Family Feud. Um, first, we're going to talk about test structure, right? And the first thing that people hate about uh, their tests are when they're just too big to fail, big, gigantic test files. And in fact, I want to pause. Have you ever noticed people who are really into, especially TDD, but testing generally, that they really, really seem to hate big objects more than other people do, big methods? And sure, I think we can all agree that big stuff is harder to deal with than small stuff, but why is it that like, testing aficionados in particular hate it? And what I found is that testing actually makes working with big objects and big methods much harder which is a little bit counterintuitive. I think that the root cause, if we were to like analyze the, the nature of big, versus big objects and big tests, is if you have like a big object, you probably have lots of dependencies. And so you could imagine that means that your tests have lots of setup. OK, that's weird. Big objects typically have lots of side effects in addition to whatever they return, which granted means like your tests might have numerous verifications. OK, that, that adds to the tests. But big objects also have many logical branches based both on the arguments you're passing it as well as like the broader state of the system. And what I find is that this is where things really fly off the rails, is you have many test cases to write based on all of those branches. And we're going to take a look at an example now. Now, I want to show some code off, but it was at this point that I realized OS 9 has no terminal because it's not Unix. Uh, so I had to go and find another one somewhere. Uh, uh, so let's check this out. We're going to boot it up. It takes a minute. Sorry, it's old. Almost there. All right, so here's our uh, uh, CRT terminal editor. Uh, this is a fully operational Unix terminal. That means I can type in arbitrary commands, like who am I? OK, great. And uh, open up Vim here. And I'm going to write a simple test of a, so let's say it's an active record model called timesheet, and there's a validation. And this validation depends on whether they've entered notes into their timesheet, whether they're an admin, if it's an invoice week, whether they've entered time. And so I've got the first case down, but then I'm thinking, OK, well, there's all these other permutations. You know, like, what if there's no notes? Or what if it's like a, a non-admin user? Or what if it's an off week instead of an invoice week? Or what if they don't have any time entered? And now I'm realizing I've got a lot of different permutations to concern myself with. This really sucks. Um, what happened here? Well, what happened is I fell victim to a thing called the rule of product. Now, the rule of product comes from the school of combinatorics and math. And the reason I know that is because it has its own Wikipedia page. And <laughs> what it says, just to TLDR it for us, is that if I've got a method like this, and it has four, uh, uh, four arguments, to figure out the number of possible combinations of those four things, you just multiply together the number of variations between them. So in this case, that would give us the upper bound of potential test cases we'd have to write. And in fact, when they're all Boolean attributes, we have a really easy case because it's only two to the fourth. So we only have to write 16 test cases for this very trivial validation method. So if you're used to writing a lot of big objects and big functions, it's not uncommon to just feel like, oh, I'll just add one more little argument here. You don't realize the implication of that statement is, and double the number of tests that I have to write. So if you're used to writing a lot of, like if you're comfortable with big code and you're trying to get more serious about tests, my recommendation to you is to Recognize testing makes writing big objects harder to deal with. Uh, uh, you, testing is supposed to make things easier to deal with, but here in this case, I, d I just advise you to stop the bleeding, stop adding on to big objects. I try to personally, when I'm writing Ruby, I try to like limit every new object I write to just one public callable method, and at most three dependencies, and maybe just a handful of arguments, and never any more than that. So I've got lots of small objects all over the place. Now, 
that people push back, right? If you're used to big objects and like seeing everything in one place, you know, that's uncomfortable. Like, how are you going to organize all this? People respond. They say, but then we'll have way too many small things. Like, how will we possibly deal with all of these well-organized and carefully named and comprehensible small things? And we always have to guard ourselves against the fact that I think as programmers, we get off on our own incidental complexity. You know, uh, uh, this enterprise CRUD stuff that we're doing doesn't have to be rocket science, but when we make it so convoluted, we feel like that's real hardcore programming, right? And so to some programmers, this advice makes them feel like you're telling them to program in easy mode, and that's my reaction. It's like, yeah, it is easy. Like, we don't have to make this stuff so hard, just write small objects. The next thing people seem to hear about their tests is the tests that go off script. What I mean is, like, when we think of code, we, we're here because code can do anything. You know, every program can be creative, unique, and solve an entirely new problem in some new and fun way. But tests can only really do three things. They all follow exactly the same script. Every test ever, you know, sets some stuff up, it invokes a thing, and then it verifies the behavior. We're all right, like, every test is re us writing the same program over and over and over again. Uh, it's been formalized in such a way as, like, you might have seen these uh, broken up into phases, the arrange phase, and then the act phase, and then the assert phase. A little bit more natural English might be given, when, and then. Um, but the important thing is that in all of my tests, I always take great pains to consistently call out all three of those phases. So, for instance, if I've got a pretty condensed-looking, like, mini-test here, what I'm going to do is, like, I'm just going to add a new line after my arrange, another new line after my act, and if I do that consistently, it means that when I'm just skimming that test, at least I always know this is set up, this is the behavior I'm invoking, and these are the assertions. And always having it thrown in that order so that it reads like that script. Uh, if I'm doing like a more BDD, r -spec -y kind of thing, then I can take advantage of, of uh, the expressiveness of r -spec. They've got constructs for stuff like let to set up a new uh, variable at the beginning. Anyone who knows r -spec is going to know, oh, that's a setup step. I can use before there to like invoke my action, which has a side effect, so there's no return value, and then I can split up my assertions into separate it blocks if I so choose, and it, and it might be more verbose, but at least at a glance, we know exactly what phase each of those lines belongs in if we're familiar with RSpec. I also try to minimize each phase to just one line per action so that it's really clear what it's doing from like the user or the stakeholder of the test perspective. Um, one way that, that I really like conceiving of this is the late, great Jim Wyrick uh, who's a huge hero of mine, uh, should be of anyone in the Ruby communities. Uh, one of uh, the, his final gems that he contributed back to us is called RSpec Given, and it provides a, a, a given when then conscientious API that tries to be as terse as possible, but still as expressive as you need for tests. Um, I think Mike, uh, Mike Morphy is in here. I think he was the one who initially ported it to Minitest. Uh, I've ported it to Jasmine, and somebody's ported that to Mocha for JavaScript tests. And uh, I really like it a lot. Like, how, what it looks like is, you know, instead of using let, we just use a more natural label given. Uh, uh, our action, we just call win. And what I really like is the assertion. So you can just say then, and you pass it a block, and it'll actually produce really good error messages by um, uh, using SourceWord to look at the AST of that block, recognizing it's a comparison, and then building, you know, dynamically uh, really good error messages whenever anything fails. What I like about tests that think about given when then like this, they're easier to read, they point out potentially superfluous test code, because if they don't fit into a given or a when or a then, uh, then something's a little weird, and they can highlight certain design smells. For instance, if you have a lot of given steps in any bit of code, then maybe you have too many dependencies or things are too hard to set up or too complex of arguments. If you've got more than one when step in order to invoke a bit of behavior, then clearly the API could be more user friendly. Like, why, why do you have to take multiple actions against an API in order to see the thing that you want to see? And if you've got a lot of then steps, then maybe the code's doing too much, or maybe you're violating command query separation by returning a value and also having side effects. These sort of smells like, this is the, what people might mean when they're saying, like, you're getting design feedback from your tests. You sort of build an intuition about this over time. Next thing people hate about tests is hard to read tests. Some people are fond of saying, hey, test code is code, and I think the implication here is, it, so you take it seriously, but like in my mind, test code is untested code, which means it should be treated with derision and skepticism, uh, I, I, uh, and minimized. In particular, logic in tests confuses the story of what's being tested, and by logic, I mean ifs and else's and branches and loops and stuff. And test scoped logic like that isn't only hard to read because it obfuscates the script we just talked about, but it also, like, any errors in there are really easy to miss because no one's testing the test. Now, 
what I find is that people most excited about testing are often the most eager to introduce test scoped abstractions for solving their test pain. For instance, in this case, somebody might see an opportunity to dry something up by looping over and generating test cases. Like, if this is the test that they're looking at, you can see they're doing some kind of like Roman numeral kata, uh, converting Roman numerals to Arabic, and yeah, there is a lot of textual duplication here. So the, the, the temptation might be, okay, let's use a data structure for all that, loop over it, and then for each of those entries in that hash, let's generate a new test. And technically, there's nothing wrong with this. This test will work, it'll give you good messages. There's nothing like technically incorrect about what this person did. But I think that they robbed themselves of an opportunity because they solved that test pain without asking themselves, maybe there's a root cause about the production code, which is granted much more important than the test code, that I could have used as design feedback instead. Because if this is what their production code looks like, and it's a bunch of ifs and else's, that all, if you look at the, like, the constant, the, the strings in there, they're all, like, the data's hiding in there. So I could pull out the same or a similar set of keys into a hash and simplify gr dramatically, get the data out of that function, and now, because, the, the, the data is all driven through that initial hash, now I don't need to worry as, about quite as many test cases. I can just test a handful of cases. I don't need 25 assertions on the front end. Sandy Metz has a thing that you might have seen uh, her talk about uh, having a squint test, and I don't have anything quite so fancy, but when I'm looking at a test suite, I open up a bunch of tests at random, and then I just look around and see like how obvious is it for me to tell you know, what is the thing that's under test, and what is like, how are the methods under test organized? Are they in order, like lexically, to like what the, what the uh, uh, subject source file is? And I like to use things like an RSpec context to indicate like these are the logical branches underneath that method being tested. And very orderly, very consistent. Most importantly, I always wanna see, can I read a range act assert really clearly in the test? Even if I'm using XUnit, there's still no reason I can't be super consistent about those kinds of things. Next thing about test structure, people hate tests that are too magic. I think some tests might struggle with not being magic enough by being too repetitive. But it's important to keep in mind, like, all software is a balancing act. You know, testing libraries and their APIs are no different. They vary dramatically in expressiveness. Some have very small APIs, and so they require you to do more heavy lifting. Some have big APIs, and so they allow for more expressive tests, but then there's more to learn. If you look at something like Minitest, you know, I love Minitest just because everything is a class. We know classes, these are methods. Uh, everyone knows method, assert in, uh, the assertions are all really straightforward. Uh, now, of course, Ryan's a funny guy, and he's got some methods you can, you can extend, like I suck and my tests are order dependent. But in general, it's a very, very small API, and that's its greatest strength. Our spec, meanwhile, has a massive API, and they've got describe and context and subject and let, uh, you know, the before with each suite and all, after each suite and all, around each suite and all, it, specify objects you have and all these rules and, and expect to be and mostly similar rules. And there's a lot to our spec, which allows you to write expressive stuff, but boy, it's a lot to learn. What I like about what Jim did with uh, our spec given is, you know, he's got given, when, then, and, invariant, and then instead of having a big assertion library, he mostly does that heavy lifting through introspection. Uh, he called it natural assertions. But unfortunately, it stands on top of all of Minitest or all of our spec, so it's not like you're actually uh, obviating that complexity, you're just standing on top of it. So that, that, all that to say that there's not like a right or wrong level of expressiveness in testing APIs, but it's important to keep in mind if you're using a small one, it means it's easier to learn, but you have to be on guard against having like complex test scoped uh, uh, logic, like introducing in helpers into your test, because obviously those are all one off and you own those forever. Whereas using a bigger test API like our spec might increase the like burden of being able to like get into that project, even though it's giving you like much terser looking tests. Uh, the last thing about test structure people seem to not like is accidental creativity. Yeah, what I found is I've only learned one thing in this whole journey, it's that consistency is worth its weight in gold. Uh, if we look at a test that's similar to one we saw earlier, open it up, I always look for like, what's the thing under test? And I always, always, always just name that subject. Then I look at like, what's the thing I'm getting back from my act step? I always, always, always name it result or results. It's just that kind of little bit of consistency. Even if that test becomes huge and terrible, at least I can scroll through and like, no, aha, that's the thing under test. I can't do that in 90% of the projects that I open. When everything is mostly consistent, then cases of inconsistency can actually convey meaning to us. 
you know, if I'm looking at your test suite and like, oh, okay, test A, B, C, D, okay, great. I'm going to stop and I'm like, oh, hey, look, test C is different. That must mean that there's something interesting about object C. So I'm like, when I'm reading that test, when I'm reading that source code, I'm going to have like, you know, my ears are going to perk up and I'm going to be a little bit more conscientious as I dive in, read it with more scrutiny because there's probably something special about it. But when every single test is its own special snowflake, I have to bring that same level of scrutiny everywhere I go. And so it's just way more cognitive depletion uh, as I'm working through your test suite. As a result, as a developer, I'd much rather main, like, inherit a gigantic test suite of hundreds and hundreds of very consistent tests, even if they're crappy and mediocre, because they can be improved in broad-based ways, versus a handful of like handcrafted, artisanal, brilliant, one-off tests. Because <laughs> These ones, if I make some improvement to test A, I'm completely, you know, starting from scratch in my own comprehension, not to mention improvement of test B and D and so forth. Readers also have this silly habit. They assume that all the code that we write has meaning. Uh, uh, that's actually not true at all in, in test code. A lot of the code that we write in our tests is simply plumbing to be able to, like, you know, uh, uh, facilitate the downstream behavior that we're trying to assert. And so I try to point out meaningless stuff so that my readers can laser focus in on the stuff that actually matters. So I try to make unimportant bits of test code obviously meaningless to the user. For instance, look at this case. The, here we're creating a new author. He's got a very realistic looking name and phone and email, but it turns out that doesn't matter. So I'm gonna change his name to Pants. And I'm gonna eliminate the phone, I'm gonna change his email to just Pants Mail. Because that's all I really need to drive the assertion I'm after. And now, what might have been like, you know, a confusing situation of like, well, why do we need a valid author here? It turns out this thing's just doing very simple string interpolation. So now, like, uh, just looking at this test, because it's so minimal, anyone could probably implement that function by just looking at it. So test data should both be minimal, but I also try to strive for minimally meaningful. Don't make something meaningful in your test data unless it really needs to be. So congratulations. We've talked a lot about test structure. Let's move on to talking about test isolation. First thing here that people, I think, really mess up is they don't have a very clear focus in their test suites. Because when teams are defining what success looks like for them, most are just happy to ask the question, is, is our stuff tested, yes or no? If yes, I feel pretty good. But there's like so many more nuanced and important questions, like, hey, is the purpose of every test readily apparent? Does the test suite promote consistency so that we can maintain it? And if we answer no here, you know, people push back because like, you know, most common feedback is like, I have all kinds of different tests that I need to write because all these conditions, because my system does a million things. But I think if you're really careful about it, there's probably like, you could identify three, four, or five different types of tests that would, you know, cover 80% of what you need. You, not every single test needs to be its own special snowflake. So what I encourage teams to do is actually create separate test suites. We can make as many folders in our, in our system as we want, right? So like create a, a separate suite with its own directory, its own configuration, its own set of conventions for every type of test that you uh, are, are gonna write in your system. That way it's supremely consistent in each one. I actually did a whole talk just on that topic called breaking up with your test suite, uh, giving some strategies and thoughts behind that. But one way to visualize test suites is this thing from Agile land called the testing pyramid. The, the short version is that illustrated uh, tests up at the top are like more integrated, more realistic, and tests at the bottom are like less integrated, more like unit tests. And most test suites that I come across, it's one big gigantic folder, and I'm gonna open up one test at random, and it calls through to other units, okay, fine. I'm gonna open up another test at random, it fakes out its relationship with maybe just some of the other units around it. Another test might hit the database, but fake out third-party HTTP APIs. Another test might call through to those APIs, but, but operate underneath the user interface. And so they're all over the place, and that means that every time a, like a pair is gonna work on a test or write a new test, they have these low value arguments of, hey, should we mock that, should we not mock that, should we? And that is not a valuable discussion to keep having. So instead, I just try to start with two suites, each approaching one extreme. I write one test suite at the top that's as integrated as I can possibly manage. That way, if I'm in an argument with my pair about whether to mock something or not, the answer is no, let's make it as realistic as we can. And similarly, I write another test suite that's as isolated as possible. So the answer is always isolate everything from all of its collaborators unless you get to the point that you're writing a pure function. Now it's really easy to know what to mock, everything. So the bottom thing, its job is to make sure each individual little file listing does exactly what it's supposed to do. And the thing at the top is ensure that when it's all plugged together, everything seems to work okay. And that seems to work pretty well for the first you know, several months of any project. Eventually, things get complicated enough where like, you might identify like a middle tier uh, where you'd like to have some test suites around the branching and that because maybe it's not so imperative anymore. 
And it's fine as long as you agree up front to like, what are the norms of that test suite? Because we have to be careful of getting all fushi again. Fushi, fushi, like, you know, squiggly lines. So in this case, last year I was on an Ember team and we agreed we were gonna start writing a middle tier type test uh, uh, for the Ember components we were writing. And all we agreed up front was we're gonna fake out all the APIs, we're not gonna use any test doubles in these tests, we're gonna trigger logical actions, not user interface events, we're gonna verify app state, not stuff that's like in the HTML that's rendered into the DOM. And we could have gone either way on every single one of those questions, but because we just agreed up front, things were much more consistent, much more manageable, and those tests now, everyone at a glance knows exactly what's happening. Another thing people hate about the tests is uh, test suites that are too realistic. And I think that teams get trapped here because it's almost as if we're asking this question about fake stuff versus real stuff of saying like, well, how realistic should your test be? And that's an unfair question because of course anyone's gonna say like, maximally realistic, I guess, just as real as possible. I wanna make sure my stuff works. And so somebody might be proud of their very realistic looking test suite because they've got a real browser opening up against a real server, against a real database, and they feel like, yes, that is maximally realistic. But you can poke holes in that. You can say, like, well, does it, for example, test through like your DNS configuration or make sure that your DNS is working? Well, no, no, of course not. Or you know, does it actually make sure that your cache and validation strategy for your CDN works? And they'll say, well, no, it doesn't test that, that far. And so what they're really saying is, yes, there is this boundary of real and fake, but it's very poorly defined and we don't understand it really well. And that gets you into trouble in situations where you know, maybe something breaks and somebody replies, hey, why didn't we write a test for that? And there's no good, good response other than, yeah, I guess we should have, or I guess we should have tested for that. It gets teams into this trap where they write some tests Stuff blows up in production, there's no help in it, it's gonna happen, and then uh, they have an after action report. They all sit down around the table and they're like, why did this happen? How can we prevent this? Never again, let's go back and increase the realism for all of our tests. Now, there's nothing wrong with realism per se, except for the fact realistic tests are slower because they have to do more stuff. They take more time to write, uh, take more time to change, and they're harder to debug. There's a higher cognitive load because they're doing more stuff and they fail for more reasons, because there's more moving parts. So there's a real cost to increasing realism that we often don't acknowledge. Additionally, having real clear boundaries wherever we set them helps us increase focus on like what's being tested and what's being controlled. So that seems like a good idea. When I find teams that have really clear boundaries about what they're testing up front, and they all agree we're gonna be real about this and fake about this, they write some tests, and you know, stuff will still blow up in production because there's no helping it. And at the end, they can stand up, have a backbone, and acknowledge, you know, we agreed up front that if testing for this classical class of issues up front was too expensive, uh, it wasn't worth the time, we can uh, absorb the hit. Additionally, it's really hard to automate stuff that we didn't predict, and we did not predict this production failure. So, so it's likely we wouldn't have had a test for it even if we had been looking for it. And finally, we might be able to write a targeted test of just that one thing that we're worried about without increasing the realism of all of our tests. So, there. We, we, we talk about realism and tests as like being a universal good, but I don't think it's an ideal necessarily because less integrated tests are useful too. They give us feedback about how our object APIs are to work with, uh, so we get the design feedback, and anytime there's a failure, it's much more local. It's easier to understand what went wrong. We spend less time trying to figure out how to uh, uh, fix things, make things work. Next thing about test isolation that people hate uh, even though they might not know this phrase, is redundant coverage. Because suppose you're really proud of the fact that you've got a huge test suite. You're testing everything. You test, you've got browser tests, you've got view tests, you've got controller tests, you've got model tests, you've got models that relate to other models, so like you've got incidental coverage by the fact of like this model depends on that model, and, and when I test this one, I'm also getting some free coverage of that test. And you're uh, really proud of having, you know, very thorough coverage. But you know, let's say you got a new requirement in that model down there, and, and you're a test first team, so you write a failing test, uh, then you write a test to make it pass, or write, write the code to make it pass, and you think, great, okay, let's, let's push that up to continuous integration. This is a guy in a construction hat, so I think this qualifies as meeting the theme of constructioneering today. I, I rarely ever do stuff on theme like that, so I'm proud. So anyway, we push it to CI, what we find is that all the other stuff just broke. The controller test depended on that former model's behavior, so did the views, and the browser incidentally depended on that too. And now, what might have taken me 30 minutes Monday morning, I'm spending two and a half days just cleaning up all these tests that broke uh, uh, incidentally. And so it was thorough, but it was also highly redundant. 
And redundant coverage can really kill team morale because in the early goings, when you can run all your tests locally and you do so really frequently, you catch this stuff. But as stuff gets too big to run really frequently locally, eventually you push it up into the cloud and you're just cleaning up CI for, for, for days and days whenever you have a new feature. You can detect redundant coverage. It turns out there's this really cool tool uh, that we can use to detect redundant coverage. It's the same way we detect any code coverage. It's just that normally, because there's cool, fancy colors, we all hone in on that first column, and we're like, aha, the coverage is low here, let's increase it. But the other columns are interesting too, it turns out. This last column, if you organize, uh, uh, sorry, by hits per line, it tells you things like, hey look, that, that method at the top is hit 256 times when I run my test. If I change that method, there's probably a whole lot of tests that are gonna break. So it's something that's worth looking for. Another approach, just heuristically, is to identify a clear set of layers to test through. So for instance, in this case, we might like, you know, really be honest with ourselves. Maybe those view tests and those controller tests aren't adding a lot of value. Maybe the browser test is enough and just testing at our model layer, eliminating entire classes of tests that might not just be adding a bunch of value. We can also try our hand at what, what, what you might call outside-in test-driven development, where you, where you work from the outside in, but every layer has test doubles that like fake out the layers below it. Uh, some people call that London School TDD or Mockist, uh, or you might have heard of the book Goose, Growing Object-Oriented Software. I've lately started calling what I do in this, in this area discovery testing. Uh, if you'd like to watch a, a free screencast series, there's one up at this URL. It's also on our blog where I talk through how to, how to do outside-in TDD if you're interested. And I can't talk about mocking and outside-in stuff without talking about how people really hate test suites that have a lot of careless mocking in them. Uh, so if you're not familiar with the term test double, a test double is a super type of any kind of fake or stub or mock or spy that you might use to, uh, uh, like, a, like a stunt double, stand in for a real thing when you're writing a test. Uh, also, like, like Jonan mentioned, uh, uh, come from a company called Test Double, so it's, we've, got a, we've got a company named Test Double. We always also maintain several Test Double libraries, so there's a little bit of brand confusion in this section of the talk. Um, Additionally, I didn't want anyone else to grab the NPM package test double, uh, so I was like, all right, let's go make a test double library for JavaScript, uh, so that's a thing now that's taking up most of my nights and weekends. Um, and that means that when I'm at a conference, people are like, oh, well, clearly you're pro-mocking. You love mock objects, right? Well, I hate mock objects because they suck on my project, uh, is a conversation that I've had too many times. And I, and I have to say, like, well, no, it's kind of more complicated than that, because I've got this very rigorous approach to using mock objects. The simplified version is to say, like, if I've got some subject that I want to write, I'll start with a test of it, and I'll imagine, like, what are the things that this thing might conceivably depend on? Well, maybe if I had A and I could pass uh, the results of A onto B and then onto C, that would carve up the work for me nicely. And so I, they don't exist yet, so I start with fakes of those things, and then I use the test as a sounding board, and I'm actively listening for, you know, like, what are the data contracts between these, these imaginary dependencies? How would the data flow between them? And then get a passing test that would like just wire up all those things together. And if there's any sort of awkwardness, it's really cheap to fix those A, B, and C dependencies because they don't even exist yet. So it's a really great way to get some design feedback early in a cheap way. Most people, I don't think, have this nuanced relationship with mock objects. I think most people try to write a realistic test, and some of those dependencies, the, the actually existing ones are wired up, they're easy to work with, but some are hard to work with, some are a pain to set up or instantiate, and so they just use mocks as like a cudgel, just like shut up the B and C, it replace you with, 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 with fakes because you're too hard to deal with, I just wanna get my test passing. They get the test passing, they're exhausted, they push it up, but really, like at the end of the day, what they did treats the symptom of that test pain, but not really the root cause that they've got these bad relationships with their dependencies. It confuses future readers because now they don't know what's really being tested, what's the value the person wanted to get out of their test. It makes me really sad because my brand is so unfortunately tied up in test doubles uh, that it gives mock objects a bad name. So I implore all of you, if you see somebody abuse a test double, please say something. Uh, feel free to hashtag it, mock your mocks, uh, and, and, and I'll follow along. Last thing about test isolation, people seem to really hate when uh, they don't have a clear story about how to integrate with their application frameworks. Because frameworks are really useful. They provide repeatable solutions to common problems, right? But the most common problem that a framework solves is how do I get my app to talk to X other thing? It's solving integration concerns. And if you think of a, a framework like this, uh, you know, I think of the code in the middle 
as being like my domain code. It's just like stuff that's just pertinent to like the, the, the app that I'm writing. And the stuff in the thin candy shell is all the stuff that's coupled to the framework that's mostly concerned with how that framework helps me integrate with other stuff. Stuff like HTTP, or email, or databases, or job queues, like Sidekick. We've got Mike right. Mike, Mike Burham, he maintains Sidekick. And Sidekick is a great job queuing solution for, for Ruby if you don't use it. I just saw Mike out of the corner of my eye. I wanted to give Mike a sidekick rocks. All right, so we all have different levels of tangling with our, with our frameworks. Like, you know, maybe you have a moderate amount of, like, code that's decoupled from your framework and uh, moderate that's um, coupled to it. Maybe you have a lot, maybe you use Rails, uh, <laughs> that's really coupled to the framework. Maybe you uh, don't use a lot of frameworks and it's just kind of like a little thin shell around it. But regardless, there's this dilemma, right? Because most frameworks focus on integration problems, and they also tend to offer us a lot of test helpers to help us write tests. But those test helpers are very integrated because the framework is trying to solve integration concerns, so naturally the test helpers assume a high level of integration, which results in people who look to their, test fr or to their framework for everything writing only integrated tests. And that leads to that realism problem that we just talked about earlier, where all of your tests are too realistic, too slow. So if some code doesn't rely on a, on a framework, your tests don't need to rely on the framework either. You can just write plain old Ruby objects and plain old tests, uh, and, and things will go much nicer. You might have one test suite that's aware of the framework and, and calls through all the framework stuff to make sure everything's working in, a, in an integrated fashion, but you might have another test suite that just focuses on your domain code with no attachment or awareness or loading of the framework. Not only is it faster, but it gives you a much clearer focus of what you own versus what you don't. So that was a little bit about test isolation. Good job, we're two thirds of the way through this show. Uh, test feedback is the last thing we're gonna talk about. I wanna start with useless error messages because it's something that really sucks about living with a lot of test suites. Uh, so let's say hypothetically I just broke the build, uh, now what? Uh, uh, for instance, like whenever I break the build at test double, uh, our branding changes from green to red. Uh, uh, I, if you go to the website, it might be because it's April Fool's Day, but apparently all of our sites are red today. Uh, I, I found out in Slack this morning when I was trying to take a different screenshot. <laughs> but seriously, now what? If I run that test that just failed up in, in Travis, uh, and I pull it down, like let's say I'm running rake here, I wanna see that test failure locally, I look for the message to figure out what went wrong, I see, okay, failed assertion, no message given. That is not helpful. Like my workflow for solving this is now I see the failure, I read the test, now I've gotta put in print statements or I have to like actively debug to figure out what the values are, what's going on, then I can change the code, then I can see the test pass, and finally I need to take a break because that just took me 20 minutes. That's not a good workflow. Now, you might brag about how fast your test suite is, but if, if you have really bad error messages when things go wrong, all that time that you're saving in the speed of your test suite might be going into analysis whenever any test fails unexpectedly. Um, a different test here, this is one that uses RSpec given, and it's, it's still really terse, but because uh, RSpec given has good messages in mind, when I run the test, I'll, I'll get a better message. Even though I'm just saying user.name equals equals, uh, you know, Sterling Archer, uh, uh, here I can see in the error, it's like, oh, Sterling Mallory Archer didn't equal Sterling Archer, I got it. I see like the comparison right next to each other, okay. And what's cool is RSpec given will actually continue invoking both sides until it doesn't have any callables anymore. So you can see underneath there, it's actually printed out the entire user object for me. And so now I might be able to diagnose the entire problem just by looking at the message output. So now my workflow is really fast. I see the failure, change the code, and then I earn a big juicy promotion because I'm so much faster at my job. So judge assertion libraries as well as uh, how you're using assertion libraries, not just on how fancy or fluent or nifty the API is, but on the quality of the messages that it's giving you. Another thing about feedback, slow feedback loops. Um, 480 is a number that I think about a lot. It's the number of minutes in an eight hour workday. And so if we use that as a baseline for how much time we have every day, let's say that I like, take 15 seconds to change my code and it takes me five seconds to run a test, and it takes me 10 seconds to like, interpret what just happened and figure out what to do next. That's a real fast feedback loop. That's the Gary Bernhardt speed feedback loop. That's 30 seconds. Uh, so that would give me an upper bound of 960 useful thoughts I'm allowed to have in a day, uh, which, which isn't a lot. Now, most of us, like me, have a lot of like, non-code responsibilities at work, so uh, you, know, you factor in some for that, factor in the context switching back and forth, and uh, that would be a 60 second loop or 480 uh, actions per day, and if this is our baseline, that would give me enough time for like two hours of meetings and email and talking to humans and stuff. Now, 
where things fly, fly off the rails is like, let's say instead of five seconds, my app is getting bigger, and now it takes me 30 seconds to run my test locally. Well, that increases uh, uh, up to 85 seconds in my feedback loop, down to 338 actions a day. But unfortunately, uh, my email box doesn't care how fast my tests are, and so I've got to increase now the amount in my feedback loop for like non-coding activities. So really, it's more like 91 seconds. Now, another thing, we just talked about um, uh, bad messages, right? If your messages are really bad, maybe instead of 10 seconds, it takes you a minute to figure out what to do next. So you're looking at like 155 seconds, that's only 185 actions per day. These little things are starting to add up. They have big impact. I've been on projects too where uh, it took me four minutes as a baseline to run like an empty cucumber test because there were so many factories and so much data set up. And so that feedback loop, super duper slow, 422 seconds. I could only ideally run that test 68 times per day uh, but in fact, you know, like if you're t if you're waiting four minutes at your terminal, you're going to get distracted by email or Reddit or Hacker News or Twitter, and so inevitably this gets bigger because I come back and I'm like, shit, my tests have been done for three minutes, and so you got to chalk that up to distraction, and that's like an 11 minute feedback loop, and so then I have like at best 43 actions per day if I don't contribute like or even think about the fact that my brain has been rotting uh, from from just how frustrating a job that is. And 43, as we can all see here, is a much smaller number than 480. Uh, so this stuff is really significant. In fact, this is really special because we just found it together. We found uh, the, the ever elusive 10x developer. Uh, so if you, whether you believe in the 10x developer or not, you'd be surprised how a few seconds here and there really tend to start to add up. I encourage everyone to pull out a stopwatch and think about where your time is going, what, is, what does your feedback loop look like, and, and what can you do to optimize it? And if you're in a system that is just like too far gone and stuff is too slow, consider like spiking out new stories, uh, new stuff that you have to do off to the side and then integrate it later with your app so that you can at least be productive when you're creating new stuff, even if it's gonna be slow once it's back and integrated. Another thing people hate about the tests, painful data. Controlling test data, really hard. Uh, you know, you can, there's a kind of a, a spectrum of how much control over your test data you might have. Like you could use inline models, you're just creating instances like by hand in all of your tests. You could use something like Rails provided fixtures, or you could use a, a data dump, like uh, I, I have like a carefully created SQL uh, file that you load at the beginning of your test. Or you could use what, what, what might be euphemistically called self-priming tests, where you don't have control of the test data. And if you want to test an API, you have to first use the API to go and create all the stuff that you want to test and then tear it down manually at the end. Um, some people are under the solution that you can like only have one test data strategy in like your entire project, but it might make sense for different test suites to have different test data strategies. So for instance, uh, you might have inline for models, you might use fixtures for integration tests, uh, data dumps are great for smoke tests if you want those to be fast, and then self-priming is really the only show in town if you're uh, trying to write tests against staging or production environments where you shouldn't have direct access to the database. So in slow test suites, I find like data setup is usually uh, the biggest contributor to that slowness, and it's usually the first place I look. Uh, I don't have any proof of that, but it felt true, so I put it on a slide. And it's always the first thing that I profile, and I, I'm very eager to like rip out, like if I'm using Factory Girl, rip it out, start over if I can, because it's really difficult, uh, uh, not, not to beat up on Factory Girl necessarily, but it's really, really difficult once you have a ton of tests to uh, completely change the, the, the test data setup because it's so tightly coupled to the tests themselves. All right, let's talk about, about uh, something J.B. Rainsberger coined, super linear build slowdown. So our intuition betrays us. We have this intuition that says, if I've got one test and it takes this long, 25 tests is gonna take 25 times as long, 50 tests is gonna take 50 times as long. The reason that our intuition tells us this is that if we've got a five second test, we assume that it's five seconds running that test. But in fact, we've got time spent in app code and we have time set in, in data setup and teardown. And maybe it's spending two seconds actually exercising the application code we write, two seconds in setup and teardown, and only one second in the test. And what like this counterintuitive aspect uh, does is it means like if we've got um, uh, five tests now, uh, maybe as our system gets a little bit bigger, as we add more tests, the app is getting more complicated. There's more interaction of features. The app code part is actually a little slower, as well as the setup teardown. We have more fixtures, we have more factories, we've got more stuff going on. So every test is getting marginally slower as we add new ones. And so our intuition says we should be along that green line, but reality starts to deviate even relatively early on. Now if we had 25 tests, maybe we start to see like, oh yeah, we're spending about four seconds in app code, six seconds in setup and teardown. 
and we start to see like, oh man, like it's not uncommon at all for me to talk to a team who's been working for a year, and they're like, yeah, our build's about 30 minutes, uh, and that really stinks. We don't know why, but you know, it's still manageable or whatever. Um, but if we go up to 50 seconds here, maybe things get a little bit slower. It's like more interaction. We very often just one or two little commits will make everything a lot slower, and we won't catch it because we, we're 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 so carefully acclimated to these tests. And then you just you see things fly off the rails. This is like a geometric curve go up. So that same same client that called me and said, "Oh, it's about 30 minutes." Not uncommon at all. Like if it takes like a year to get you to a 30 minute test suite, like three months later, you're at like a three hour test suite and just like everything in your organization is like come to a crawl. Uh, because in that first 25 tests, maybe we only increased, like we deviated from our expectation by 150 seconds, but by the end, 500 seconds in the second 25 tests. This is a really common phenomenon that, that I see over and over again. So in general, when I'm writing a new story for any new application, I avoid the urge to just create some new CRUD integration test to go along with it. I try to find a way to exercise that new feature with an existing suite, uh, or with an existing test, snaking through the system wherever possible so I'm not slowing everything down. Another thing you can do is you can set like a budget for your test. You might say like, hey, we're gonna have like not allow more than five minutes of runtime for our entire test suite. And once we get up to five minutes, we have to stop. We either have to make the test faster, make the system faster, or throw out a test before we can write a new one. Last thing we're gonna talk about, false negatives. So. If you ask the question, like, what does it mean when a build fails, people will say, well, well, it means the code's broken, right? Especially our managers would probably all think that. But that's not really quite true. Because what file needs to change to fix the build? Well, more often than not, we have to update a test to fix it. So in that case, it, it was a test that was broken, not the code. And this gets to this definition between true and false negatives. A true negative, when you have a red build, it means that the code is broken and the fix is to go fix the code. That's, a, that's great. A false negative, red means that like we forgot to update a test somewhere. So essentially our work was unfinished. The fix is to go update the tests. So true negatives, they reinforce the value of our test. They make us feel good. Unfortunately, they are depressingly rare. I can only think of a few times in the last six months that a test actually caught a bug for me. Uh, so that's a bit of a bummer. False negatives, they erode our confidence in our test. They, they uh, uh, are what make tests, especially slow test suites, feel like a chore that bum teams out. So the top causes that I found for, for false negative test failures, if you got a lot of redundant coverage, you have unexpected failures, if you have a lot of slow tests and you're not able to run them all locally, i.e. you have a lot of integration tests. So that like, if you've been like zoning in and out of this, what's now a little bit of a way too long talk, sorry about that. If you've been zoning in and out, the TLDR is like write less integration tests, write fewer integration tests and you'll be a lot happier. Um, one thing I do is I track whether each build failure is a true or a false negative and how long it takes to fix it. And it, this is an interesting exercise if this is a new concept to you. Like, it might be interesting to look back in the last couple of weeks of failures and see how many were true negatives and genuinely valuable and how many were false negatives and just waste. Because that waste can be used to like analyze like, hey, we wasted, you know, 40 man hours last week. We could use that same amount of time to invest in broad based improvements to our tests to reduce redundant coverage or reduce unnecessary integrated tests. So congrats, we got through all three of these sections. Um, you know, this test, or this talk is a little bit of a downer because it's about 15 things people hate. Uh, but remember, no matter how bad your tests are, uh, I probably hate Apple Works more than you hate your tests. Uh, this is a real pain in the ass, uh, but I'm really glad that, that I got to share all this with you today. Um, if your team is hiring, I know everyone is always hiring and they're always looking for senior awesome developers and it's hard to find them. Uh, test double as an agency, we would love to hire us instead. We'd love, we work with existing teams. We love working on big gnarly apps alongside engineers, uh, 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 you know, helping each other get better as we go. If you're interested in helping improve how the world writes software, consider joining test double. I'm going to be around all day. Uh, we got Dustin Tinney here and Katie Miller also from test double. Uh, we'd love to talk to you. And, uh, most importantly, thank you for sharing all this time with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Justin. You did